Good morning, Pensar basketball community. I thought it would be about time that this channel finally start moving towards the NBA draft. The Toronto Raptors have a bunch of draft picks and hopefully they'll have that lottery pick, that top six protected pick that might be going to San Antonio. Hopefully it stays with Toronto and maybe there's some luck on lottery night. We don't know. It's a top six protected pick. Who knows? The Raptors might end up with a top three pick, a top two pick, or they might even get the number one overall pick, at which point you might be wondering, what's the point, Rob? This draft is trash. There's no stars. There's no all stars. There's no superstars. What's the point? Well, I'll tell you the point. The point is every single draft in NBA history has yielded at least an all star, right? At least something. In today's episode, we're going to talk about how to scout, how to look for what I look for. And look, I've been right. I've been wrong. It's right about Scotty. Um, I was wrong about, I've been wrong about a lot of players, been wrong about Walker Kessler. Like you, it's never an exact science. And when you're talking so many factors, it's a process of perfecting the process every single year. You get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. You learn from what you missed before. You learn to examine your biases and how you might have, you know, overlooked that guy because he was at a small school. And then you learn for the next year. Hey, Davidson, Steph Curry, not a big deal, right? You might overlook a guy because of his JUCO status. You might overlook him because of age. You might look at overlook him because of measurements. You might overlook him because he's a chubby white guy from Serbia named Nikola Jokic. And then you watch that player become an MVP and you you start to look for that. But don't overcorrect because now you start to look for the next Jokic, the next Shengun, the next, and there might not be a next. So there's a lot of considerations there. So we'll talk about biases. We'll talk about how to look for that. We'll talk about projecting up advantages factoring for gaps in knowledge, the known known, known unknowns, and the unknown unknown arguments. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, fit. We'll talk about fit versus talent. When should you ever draft for, ta you know, uh, they, there's this old adage that you should never draft for fit at the top of the draft. Maybe you should draft for fit at the bottom of the draft. I think it's always a combination of fit and talent. Best player available is the player that fits your system. Okay. Advanced stats. We'll talk about that and, you know, why they could be indicators of potential, but maybe you're not looking at the right advanced stats and maybe that that should be a consideration. Um, a lot of draft success stories like Pascal Siakam, it was really hard to see, but someone saw it. The Raptors saw it. So we'll figure out how that was exactly. We'll talk about how to break down film and why the interview process is so important when it comes to breaking down the film of an 18 or 19 year old player. Um, we'll talk about if the Raptors can find a star in this draft that is allegedly starless. Can the Toronto Raptors actually find a, you know, a tier one type of all star type of guy that you could actually build towards with Scotty, with Emmanuel quickly? And will that player be an overlap? Will it be a player who cannot play with Emmanuel quickly? What does that mean for Emmanuel quickly? We'll definitely talk about why the Raptors flexibility given, you know, the cap space that they freed up, the Bruce Bound contract, Kelly Olynyk, all of that stuff that they've been shuffling the deck in order to clear up some cap space, why that might be a bit of a blessing in disguise, given the fact that they might have a, upwards of three draft picks. And we will address, you know, something that happened earlier today on Player's Choice, where I got cooked for my take on Cade Cunningham and Malik Monk. And I really, I've had a lot of thoughts about it since that episode ended. I felt like I got a little bit ganged up on it, and I feel like I got a little bit you know, I was pissed while it was happening, but I do have my I do have my reasons and I do have my points. And I think that the conversation around Cade and the conversation around Malik is a great example of why people really, really don't understand basketball sometimes. OK, so first up, we are very, very close to hitting eight thousand four hundred subscribers, I believe. So if you're one of the next three subscribers, I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, the player's choice. Uh, episodes have been fire. It's been awesome. It's been really cool to be having like, you know, mid afternoon episodes and, and knowing like 14, 1500 people are watching at the same time. I hope one day the Pinsire basketball can attract 1500 people to a live stream. That would be awesome. We got really close. We got really close. We got We got up to a thousand and I was like, wow, that would be great if that could be a regular thing. I feel like this channel has to get a lot better for that to happen, but we'll get there. Um, okay, let's get into it biases. Okay. We all have existing biases. 
you know, we might have a school that we don't like, we might have a country that we don't have a particular favorable, you know, we don't have a favorable relationship with that country in our mind, because that prospect that we thought was good once came from that country, and he was a bust. So and this guy looks like that guy. So he might also be a bust, he might even be related to that guy. So he might also be a bust, we need to factor up for our biases. These biases include size, length, age, comparison, role, program, origin, and looks. You might not think looks factor into it, but they do. I promise you the way a prospect looks on the basketball court, the way he talks, the way he dresses, the way he carries himself, his social media appearance, all of these things, his his riz factor, if you want to call it, all of these things factor into biases that can blind scouts into thinking that a guy is way better than he is or way worse than he is. I'll take, for example, my countryman, Nikola Topic. Now, I posted a couple of videos of Topic going completely nuts in the pick and roll game and getting downhill at will. And a lot of people are like, yeah, but he's doing it against these European players. Look at the defense that he's playing up against, whatever. Need I remind you there's no defense of three seconds in Europe? Like, <sighs> I mean, these guys are not NBA athletes, but the competition in Europe for an 18-year-old kid to be doing some of the stuff that this guy's doing, driving at will, getting past guys, I understand he's not getting past OG Ananobi over there, but don't act like he's doing it against scrubs. He's doing it against competition that is significantly better than anything, you know, that Kentucky has faced this year. I'll guarantee you that. And, you know, people don't seem to think too much about, you know, Rob Dillingham doing it. So I'm just saying, keep that in mind. But also, <clears throat> I noticed a couple of people saying he moves funny. And I was like, aha, yes, he does. He has a very weird build. He has a very long neck. He has kind of short legs and he does have a sort of upright way of moving around and it's a little unconventional i gotta tell you rhythm is a very important thing when it comes to scouting prospects and i tell you that the guards who have this very herky jerky style of basketball they are often the hardest to stop in the pick and roll i think about guys like jaw i think about guys like derrick rose i think about guys who have just weird movement patterns and of course with derrick rose it led to a lot of injuries but if it's a little awkward you know, it's I call it the half step, right? Like with a guy like Rob Dillingham and, you know, not to harp too much on this because we'll talk about Rob Dillingham and we'll talk about Nikola Topic and what I like about these particular players uh, when we talk about can the Raptors find a star and what that star might look like. But when you look at a guy like Rob Dillingham, a lot of it is one speed. There's a lot of like just go, go, go. And, and we've seen a lot of prospects like that in the NBA and they don't, they don't typically project to be superstars because superstars manipulate the defense. Are you in control of the game or are you being controlled by the game? You know what I mean? So are you managing the game properly? These are things to look for, for sure. But size, length, these things play a factor too, right? When a guy measures out a little bit shorter, like a guy like Brandon Pajemski. Brandon Pajemski is a damn baller. And Santa Clara is a hell of a program and it has produced back-to-back -back sleepers. Might it be time to start taking Santa Clara prospects a little seriously? Maybe, or maybe it was just a very lucky three-year run for Santa Clara basketball, right? It's not definitive, okay? It doesn't mean that because Peyton Watson and Jaime Jaquez are coming from one program that suddenly that program becomes a gold mine. But it's something to observe. It's something to look at. It's not that, oh, because, you know, 20, you know, Kentucky guards are successful that every Kentucky guard is going to be successful. Not every Kentucky guard has been successful, but I'll tell you the vast majority of them have been goddamn successful and you need to look into that. But that's not the be all and end all. And it doesn't mean that because Texas A&M hasn't produced a, an NBA player in a while that they'll never produce one. You need to keep looking. You need to keep your eyes open. These are biases to factor for. They're not biases to live by. They're biases to understand that it might be swaying your thinking. Length. You know, when a guy has a negative wingspan or a lower wingspan or whatever, you don't have super long arms. Well, last I checked, there's a lot of NBA players that have been very successful with shorter arms. Shorter arms are linked to better shooting. Look at a guy like Desmond Bain. I feel like the way Desmond, I think Desmond Bain is a perfect example for all of these biases. All of them. You know, he's a little bit older. He kind of looks a little stumpy. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't have this super, super big height. You're not really sure. Is he a combo guard? Whatever. He has these T-Rex arms. And people just don't take him as seriously as they should. Desmond Bain is a hell of a player. A hell of a player. The Raptors missed on him by one pick. And you you better realize, like, I mean, a lot of teams missed on this guy. But 
the greatness was evident right there. People need to factor for this type of player. Um, Roll. Is he coming off the bench like a Marvin Williams, you know, in North Carolina? Is he coming off the bench? Uh, is he a third guy? Is he a second guy? Is he a primary guy? Are you over factoring for the fact that he's the man on his team in college? And he has a lot of help around him. How how appropriately are you factoring his contributions given his role? Because it's very possible to be a second option, but because your overall contributions, like your maybe, I don't know, a 24% usage guy, but your overall contributions as a secondary playmaker, as a help defender, as a system defender, as a leader, your intangible skills are generating so much more actual value than the first option, who's just a really good shot maker perfectly possible so don't just immediately assume that because a guy is the man in college that he's going to be the man in you know at the next level like a keontae george bryce sensabaugh guys like that who are high volume guys cam whitmore is another guy from the last draft but shot making is a talent so don't also figure that because the guy isn't super efficient as a first option that he can't project into something else um origin as i said Guys come from different track records, right? They come from different pipelines. Some guys come from the JUCO system. Some guys come from overseas. Some guys come from the G League Ignite program. Some guys come from, you know, um, overtime elite. I mean, a lot of people, I would say, downplayed Asar Thompson and Amen Thompson because they're like, well, look at the competition that they're facing at overtime elite. But you have to watch the game tape on these guys and just say, yeah, but movement is movement. And these guys move really freaking well regardless of who they're playing this comes up to the next thing which is factoring gaps in knowledge the known knowns the known unknowns and the unknown unknown arguments right here's the thing there are known knowns when it comes to certain players right you can measure their hand size you can assume that it's not going to get that much bigger you can measure their height you can measure their wind sprint you can measure you know um you know, their wingspan, you can test their vertical, you can test all of these things. These are known knowns. You know how old they are, you know, um, you know, that they have a solid right hand, you can you can take the tracking data and you can say, well, they have a weak left hand, because, you know, 92% of their finishes at the rim, they're going back to their right hand, you can, you know, use the tracking data, or your eye test to say, they're weak left hand passers, they can't make this pass the you know, the snake dribble always ends up being, you know, a left hand finish. You can do all of these things. These are known knowns. These are things you know. Then there are known unknowns. There are known unknowns as well. You can make a list of known knowns. And on the other side of that list, you can make a list of known unknowns. The known unknowns are simple. How will this player react to, you know, the pressures of being in a different city than the one that they're growing up in? How will this player react to being, you know, a role player for the first time in their life? This is a known unknown. You don't know. You can make an educated guess, but you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it. Until you don't not know it. My bad. A lot of these things are known unknowns. Scotty Barnes jumper is a really, really good example of a known unknown. You don't know. When you draft him out of Florida State, you don't know if that jumper is going to get a lot better. He shot 27% from, from three at college three, and you're talking about being a competent NBA shooter. You're, you're, you're betting on a lot of wishful thinking there that he's going to become that. Same thing when you trade for Emmanuel quickly. Even in pro scouting, there are known unknowns. You have watched him be a spark plug off the bench, but you haven't seen him run a winning organization as a lead guard. That's a known unknown. You have to make an educated guess. You have to you have to check the data, check check the game film, see maybe certain situations where he did step into that situation that you're trying to put him into, and see how he operated in that situation. It'll be a small sample, but at least it'll be something, right? Same thing with the known unknown of competition level going up. Take any guy from the G League or take any guy from college or any, any guy from overseas. How is he going to react to more length, more size, more games? He's going to need to be more durable. He's going to need to take better care of his body. He's going to need to, how do you react to the pressures of being a professional athlete for the first time in your life? You know, there's money involved now. Now you got the money. Are you going to, you going to, going to become complacent? That's a known unknown. These are all known unknowns. And quite frankly, the list of known unknowns is usually a little bit longer than the list of known knowns when it comes to prospect. I mean, you could say they're both endless lists. If I really want to get really, really, really deep into a Nikola Topic 
you know, known, 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 unknown chart, it would be 25 pages long. And that's typically how long these charts are. When it comes to substantial scouting, you're talking temperament, you're talking pressure. How does this player react under pressure? The analytics, these are all known knowns, you know, their, their PR, the shooting percentage, true shooting percentage, how well they shoot from the left corner, right corner. These are all known knowns. How well will they shoot against NBA defenders? Suddenly every known known comes with an unknown component of how it projects forward. So these are known knowns and known unknowns. But what about unknown unknowns? These are the things you cannot project that you don't even realize you don't know. You don't know what you don't know, right? This list is blank. It will be filled later. We call it the TBD list, okay? Because these are things later on, five years later, that you wish you checked for, but you didn't have the insight. The goal of any professional scout is to make sure that the list of unknown unknowns is as small as humanly possible when checked five years later. That's what I'll say about that. How about fit versus talent? Fit versus talent. You know, there's this old adage, you never ever draft for fit, always for talent. Okay, I get it. Just compile talent and it'll take care of itself. But it never works that way, does it? You need to have a plan for a prospect, which is what I really admire about the Toronto Raptors and their usage of Grady Dick this year. They didn't over leverage him as a starter on day one, as much as, you know, quite frankly, I would have been perfectly fine if he started on day one, but they had a better plan than I did. And they brought him along slowly and they had the G League program. They need to do some serious work before next season to make sure that that program is running a little bit better because I have not been thrilled about the G League program for the last two years. It's a far cry from what it used to be. I don't know if that needs a coaching personnel change or better talent or what, but I have just not been super impressed with the G League. However, this year it has yielded quite a few roster mainstays. It has yielded guys like Javon Freeman Liberty and Jonte Porter. And, you know, frankly, that's an upgrade over whatever the hell it's yielded the last couple of years because guys have not really busted up off that level. Granted, the Raptors have been better the last few years. So maybe those opportunities did not exist. But I've been very impressed with Javon Freeman Liberty. And I, as much as I did not like Grady's stint in the G League, I understand that that was a really big part of his strength and conditioning program. And that's important too. The point I'm making here is fit matters. Grady fit into the way the Raptors wanted to play basketball. Number one, he fit into their current roster plans. They had a plan that, you know, the season was going to go one of two ways. They made a decision at the 30 game mark that it was going to go the other way. And they slowly ramped him up. And now he's getting starter minutes and he's playing in solid defenses. And when you go at the end of the year, you have examples of Grady as a 20 minute per game guy, a 10 minute per game guy, a G League guy, a starter, a second option, a fifth option starter, a second option starter. You have everything now. Now you have put Grady into 30 different situations in one season. You know how many situations the Detroit Pistons have put Cade Cunningham into this season? One situation. He has been in no other situation other than the situation he's been in all season. Literally, his entire career has been one situation. I appreciate the Raptors for doing this because this is the data that helps you get better because you're training this offseason in terms of what you're going to ask him to work on what role you can project for him next season based on that training is only going to be as effective as the data sets that you have to go on for this season. And luckily for the Toronto Raptors, whether we're talking Grady Dick, whether we're talking Scotty Barnes, whether you're talking Emmanuel Quickly, RJ Barrett, or any of the young players on this team, or even guys like Jonte Porter, Gary Trent, whoever, Ochai Abaji, any of these guys, you have many different examples of them serving many different roles. What's important about that is, again, it gives you a broader sample. You know, people, like, I have a stats degree. People always misquote this small sample, large sample. I talk about bias samples all the time. And here's the problem with sometimes the sample is just too static. You have a sample of one guy playing as a left corner spacer for the entire year against the entire league. 
you don't know how that guy operates in the pick and roll as a ball handler. You don't know how he operates as a roller. You don't know how he operates as a cutter. You just don't have intel on this stuff. You don't know how he is as a finisher because he's literally been parked out in the corner for the entire season. This is the problem that I had with the Raptors last season is guys' roles were way too static, way too inconsistent, and just simply put, not rooted in growth. The Raptors this year have been all about growth. It's not resulting in winning, so a lot of people are upset. When it comes to projecting who you're going to pick this year, you need to have a plan, which means that at least to some extent, fit must be factored in terms of how that player projects against your current roster, number one. Number two, how he fills into the various stages of development and how you're going to get him minutes on the court. Now, you have a play, you have some existing tent poles. I'm assuming Emmanuel Quickly will be here. I'm assuming RJ Barrett will be here. I'm assuming that Scotty Barnes will be here. Well, I, mean, I know Scotty Barnes is going to be here. So those three players are pretty much tent poles. You can probably factor Grady into that. So does drafting a player with all the same strengths and weaknesses as Grady Dick, does that complicate that player's pipeline to getting minutes? Can they play together? And if they can't play together, do you have a contingency plan after a couple of years to part ways with one of those two players? Because assets are not formed in a vacuum. You're not buying a television. You're not buying a computer. You're, you're, you're drafting a player. And that player needs opportunities and a role to grow into, right? It's like buying a home and then going to a garage sale and buying 35 televisions because that was the best deal. Okay, granted, you have 35 televisions now. You bought the best asset, but you don't have a fucking couch and you don't have a dining table. You're gonna, you're gonna, what are you gonna do? You're gonna construct three televisions together to make a dining table, and then you're gonna construct 12 televisions together to make a seat and four televisions together to make a couch. At some point, you do have to have some diversity because at some point, you're gonna realize that a guy like, I mean, everyone talks about the OKC Thunder, right? OKC Thunder, they pick the best player available, best player available. Yes, they do but they reconstruct the roster every single time to make sure that that player still fits. A guy like Josh Giddy right now, he doesn't fit too well because he's complicating their spacing completely. And at some point, at some point, they're going to have to get rid of him because Casey Wallace is going to usurp him at some point in terms of actual utility. And at that point, you're going to hurt the development of Casey or you're going to hurt the actual trade value of Josh Giddy. They're not going to get a ton of value for Josh Giddy because the jig, the jig is up. The jig is up, you know? So that's what I'm saying. You need to factor for both. Now, never ever do I ever mean that, oh, we need a center, so we need to draft the center, come hell or high water. It's never that absolute. But I'm saying that at some point, yeah, I know I know certain general managers do think that way, you know? But if you think that the Dallas Mavericks drafted Derek Lively because Luka needed a center, you're crazy. No, centers are dirt cheap in the NBA. They drafted Derek Lively because he synergizes a very effective part of Luka's game. And that matters. It matters. Because right now, if I could take Derek Lively, Cade Cunningham, swap, swap, the Pistons get the Pistons probably get worse. And I can tell you right now, the Mavericks get a lot worse. Because Cade and, and Luka... There's just not any place for him to be on the basketball court. So how are you supposed to get him reps if he can't play? You need shooters around Luka. You need cutters. You need great defenders. Kate is none of those things. So where is, so if, if the Dallas Mavericks have the 2020, you know, the, the first pick in the 2021 draft, they have to go for Evan Mobley. They have to go for a Scotty Warrens because if you draft Cade, it's not going to work. Now, you might say, well, they have Kyrie Irving. Please not put Kyrie Irving and Kate Cunningham in the same conversation. What I'm saying is roster redundancy can be an issue, okay? That's my philosophy. Obviously, if Kate Cunningham is legit, like if, you know, in 2021 you're drafting and you think he's legitimately going to be a superstar, then you have to pick him. Because if the gap in talent is that substantial, then you have to pick him. You don't go for fit at that point. But... This notion of blanket statementing, like fit doesn't matter, it's always talent, I disagree. It's always at least 20% relevant to see how the player fits into your play style, 
in terms of your current roster and how that player fits around your star and on your roster. Is he going to be a bench player? Do you project him to be a role player? Do you project him to be a defensive prospect, offensive prospect, et cetera? Okay, moving on. Advanced stats and indicators of potential. Difficult, really, because advanced stats are so often misunderstood. Look, different college programs play different strength levels of competition. Um, different Euro leagues, you know, uh, or European clubs play in different leagues. How do you measure what 12 points on 62% true shooting means in, in Greece, in France versus at Kentucky? It's really difficult when you can't homogenize, when you can't put it all into one pot, it becomes very difficult, but there are certain things that I think do translate in terms of shooting and overall, um, Shooting is the one thing that I think it translates very well. But it's not an absolute percentages game. You need to go a little bit deeper into the shooting and you need to see how those shots are being generated, self-generated versus catch and shoot versus off movement. You need to get deeper into the tracking data, but don't take the holy grail of, okay, this guy has this PER, this guy has this VORP, or this guy has this box plus minus in college, and therefore that's the holy grail and he's great. I do think that with upperclassmen, like, you know, second, third, fourth year guys, I do look for consistent growth and development. Granted, Malachi Flynn was a hell of a player. Also worth noting, in college, he did play in a weaker conference. That's worth noting too, right? So again, competition matters because who you're putting those numbers up against matters, right? I, I, I argued about this with Fred Van Vliet all last year and the year before, which is, who do you do your damage against, right? Are you scoring your points against the Clippers and the Bucks and the Celtics? Or are you doing it against a depleted Charlotte team? And that to me matters. So maybe with certain programs, they don't really play anyone all year. They play maybe three or four really good teams. See how they did in those four really good against those four really good teams. Um, I think that matters. And then maybe you have to isolate the variables and that. Maybe if you're trying to figure out if a guy can shoot the three try to look at their long two point percentage and see how they're doing from various core various places on the court i have yet to see a guy who is like an 85 percent free throw shooter who simply cannot shoot threes if you can shoot you can shoot now i'm saying it's not automatic to say oh he's an 85 percent free throw shooter so he's gonna be a great three-point shooter but shooting potential is shooting potential and it usually shows up in free throws and free throws are a great equalizer because the length is pretty much the same across the board and if a guy's like a 92% free throw shooter, but he's like a 22% three point shooter on low volume, I think that's a workable equation, especially if the sample size is pretty big. So that's just me. Moving on to how to break down film and why interviews are so important. So there's a couple of prospects where I just fell in love with those prospects because of their game tape and their interviews. Two of them are Kevin Durant and Scott and Scotty Barnes. And I got to tell you, their interviews had a lot to do with it too. You know, it's not exact. It's hard to determine when someone's telling the truth, especially when agents and, you know, coaches are prepping these players with the exact answers. But you know a scripted answer when you hear it because it's always the same. I listen to players talk about, you know, their origin story, their dreams, their hopes, you know, their game, who they compare themselves to. And I'm really looking, you know, across four or five interviews, if the story ever changes, if it ever gets reworded, this is getting very, very conspiratorial and a little bit like a detective work type of thing. But I think that it's relevant to know that, you know, original thoughts don't need to be scripted. You know, when you're speaking off the cuff, even when I understand that there are intense pressures put on these players to give an answer that is acceptable, like, you know, for instance, the where do you see yourself next year? Whatever my team needs from me, I'm going to do that, whatever. But even in those scripted answers, you do get elements of the truth if you're really looking for it and you know what you're looking for. In terms of how to break down game film, honestly, I like to ver you know, I like to I like to break down by situation. So if I want to look at a player's pick and roll ball handling, I have to slow it down. I have to look at maybe 50 to 80, maybe a hundred plays with them as a pick and roll ball handler um or you know 45 to 60 you know uh, spain pick and rolls and just see how they read each situation based on how they should have read it and what they consistently do well and what they consistently don't do well 
I'll give you an example of a particular player where I was like kind of shocked at how poorly he did this, right? Actually, it's both players. So I talked about Rob Dillingham and Nikola Topic, right? Rob Dillingham plays for the Kentucky Wildcats, uh, um, and he is a very, very good um, scorer and shot maker. And Nikola Topic plays in Serb, uh, you know, in, in Europe right now, and he's um, he's about a six foot five, six foot six point guard prospect. They're both guard prospects. They both probably project at the next level, at least initially, to be bench initiators off the bench. And, you know, looking at their tape in the pick and roll is very interesting. So they both have different tendencies, right? So some guys like with Rob Dillingham, right? You'll see, you'll see the double come over and you'll see him struggle to make the pass around with the left hand. He'll struggle a little bit with the left hand, struggle a little bit with the read, um, he kind of plays a little hot potato with the basketball sometimes where, you know, he don't know what to do. So he'll get up in the air and he'll get himself trapped or with Topic, it's a little bit different. He starts to lean back and then it sometimes leads to some turnovers. He's a much, I think, I think Topic is like, you know, he's talked like people talk about his limited vision. I, I'm not seeing that so far. I've seen only three games, uh, this year, but I'm not seeing a lot of limited vision. I'm actually seeing a guy who makes some very interesting reads with both hands. Now, this is the thing, both hands. What assists per game does not factor is how quickly you're making reads and how advantage generating they are. Advantage generation is a big thing. When you're playing against inferior competition, you should be seeing the game much better than your competition. That's why you're going to the next level because you're ahead of the level that you're on. But what happens when a guy just has such a high usage that he's going to get you know, seven to eight assists no matter what. And people are going to go crazy over that. Oh, this guy gets seven assists. He must be a great playmaker. Not so fast. Not so fast. I look at the percentages that guys shoot on your passes, how accurate your passes are, how dynamic your passes are, how often you're finding open shooters and open cutters versus contested shooters, how early in the clock you're generating those advantages. All of these things matter. And overall, what I do is I, I create a quadrant in terms of like, a particular play so we go over and over and over and we take a hundred nikola topic possessions in the pick and roll where you know he gets a drag screen or whatever so some sort of screen where he is the ball handler in a pick and roll and then maybe take a hundred possessions where he doesn't have the basketball and somebody else is going to score and he never ever is involved in the play in terms of touching the basketball and I want to see what he does when he doesn't touch the basketball on those 100 plays. And then the other 100 plays, I want to see how he operates as a ball handler and pick and roll. And then I have a grading system where I'll draw it into four quadrants, which is, you know, uh, like a like an A, B, C, and D, you know, or a C, D, and an F, right? And I'll just see, like, how often and what was the consistent thing. Or maybe you won't do it like an A, B, C, and D, whatever, but we'll say, like, you know, in... 35% of those things, he picked up his dribble too fast. Or in 35% uh, of the possessions, he failed to make a cut when one was available to him. Of course, it's very difficult because you don't know if the coach has specifically told him to use those as rest possessions because he's playing too many minutes. Sometimes coaches do this. They just say, you know, just stand in the corner and, and take a breath on this play. You don't always know, but it does help to understand what his tendencies are in those specific plays. And I mean, you know, with certain players, you notice that when they don't have the basketball, they're useless. Well, then now that gets to the next point, which is number one. Well, let me talk about why interviews are so important. And then, of course, we have to talk about, you know, how you project up. Right. Because, again. On player's choice, we had this thing where we were debating for six hours, basically. So it was three hours the day before yesterday and then six, three hours yesterday. So it was three hours, three hours, two shows, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. every single day. And we went through every guard in the NBA and no, Scotty did not come up and no, Gary Trent did not come up. And yes, Emmanuel quickly somehow got fucking shoved into one star and I was just looking, looking at like, what? So the basis for for the for the for the tiers was a five star player was like first option on a championship team, a four star player was a player who could be one of the top three contributors on a championship team. Think Jamal Murray. If Jamal Murray is your best player, you're not winning a championship. Jamal Murray is one of your top three guys in a championship run. You're good, right? So that's a four star. Three star was a key starter. When I say key starter, I don't mean 
you know, a token starter. I don't mean, you know, a replacement starter. I mean like a key starter on a championship team. And Aaron Gordon would be a great example of a key starter. That's a three star. Two star was a definite, definite factor on a championship team. So we're talking, you know, the level of Norman Powell is the definitive two star player. One star was a fringy rotation player, like a uh, eighth guy, ninth guy, tenth guy, eleventh guy, twelfth guy, like that to me. And then no star was you get no minutes on the championship team. Malachi Flynn is a great example of a zero star player. I think um, who else? Javon Freeman Liberty is a great example of a zero star player right now. There's no championship team in the league in which he would get a minute for. So a lot there's probably like a hundred no star players in the NBA. There's probably two hundred, you know, one star, two star players. And then the rest of the league is distributed between three stars. There are very few five stars. And so I think when I think about prospects, I look at most of these guys in high school, they're all five stars. Everyone who you're talking about in the NBA draft was a five star in, in high school. When they moved to college, they might have descended down to a four-star. They might have moved down to even a three-star or a two-star. Some guys remained five-stars. Anthony Davis, Carl Anthony Towns, Carmelo Anthony. These guys remained five-star throughout. The question then becomes, how do you project if a five-star could satisfy the requirements of being a three-star or a two-star? Let me make my point. If you have the basketball in your hands, you have a disproportionate amount of control over the offense. However, if you do not have the basketball in your hands a lot, you have to have a different set of skills. Different set of skills like Trey Murphy III is a great example, a great example of a three-star player. He might be one of the best three-star players in the NBA. What does he do? He shoots the basketball. He provides space for other people. He runs the court in transition, and he's a good defender. These are the things that I look for in a three-star player. A three-star is like an elite, elite role player, like the elite of the elite. See, because stars elevate role players, but role players also elevate stars. And this sort of symbiotic relationship between the two can never be understated. So you want to believe that a ball-dominant, chucking, you know, high-usage, low-efficiency player is going to be the perfect guy to put next to LeBron, D-Wade, and, you know, and, and Chris Bosh. But he's not. He's not going to play on that team because they don't need his skill set because they have guys who are vastly better than him at that skill set. That's why you prefer, if you are the Miami Heat looking for a championship, you're going to, or let's let's use the Golden State Warriors. That's why you prefer an Andre Iguodala, right, over a J.R. Smith. J.R. Smith is probably a bad example. Um, high usage guy. I don't know. John Wall, you know, like, the Golden State Warriors, I mean, in theory, if you think about it, John Wall is a much better player than Andre Iguodala, peak for peak, right? I don't want to say much better, but he was better, marginally better. He's more talented. But who do the Golden State Warriors need more? You know, Sean Livingston, because he plays defense, because he's a really heady playmaker, because he makes other people better without having to dominate every single possession. So when a guy in college or in high school, and the only tape you have of him is of him being the man, you have to ask yourself, what does he do when he's not the man? What does he do? What other skill sets does he have? And typically, it's going to be very, very hard to find those skill sets on display in the college game, unless that player plays for a blue blood, like a super serious powerhouse. Like, you know, if they play for a Kentucky or a Duke or something like that, maybe they're already a second or third option on that team. And now you're seeing it. Or maybe if it's like a guy like Jordan Hawkins, where he kind of works himself up into it. Now you have better data to project how Jordan Hawkins might be as a third or fourth option because you've seen that, but you also have data to see how he might be as a top scorer because you've also seen that. It helps to have a range. Delano Banton was a great guy, a great example of a guy where there was a little bit of range in his career in college where you could see how he might operate in different situations. Scotty Barnes is another example of a guy where the Raptors had full confidence based on his Monverde tape, but also his EYBL tape, that he could be both. That he could be the third, fourth, fifth guy in a team which featured better players than him, but eventually that he could also be like a lead initiator, you know, uh, wing forward guard hybrid like the one that he was in EYBL. We had samples of both. We had samples of him being the man. We had samples of him being a driver in offense, but we also had 
you know, samples of him being a connector of the offense. Scotty Barnes is a very unique prospect for that reason. I think Franz Wagner is another example of a very unique prospect in that situation because you have a team like Germany, you know, the German national team, in which he is more of a secondary third guy. And then you have a team like, you know, uh, in, in in college where you could say, okay, he's he's clearly more of the guy here. So I think these are all good examples. Um, let's move on. The interviews, why are the interviews so important? I think the interviews are important not only from the perspective of rephrasing versus phrasing and how people you know talk about themselves and how scripted their answers are and the moments of truth that come come through it but the one thing that i'm looking for the thing that i really liked about jairus walker last year the thing that i liked about dyson daniels and what really drew me to those two prospects scotty barnes kevin durant jabari smith all these guys that i would just like i would vouch for those guys is their self-awareness their ability to understand honestly where their strengths and weaknesses are and you can see that they're working on them this to me is important because it gives me an insight into who you are it gives me an insight into how critically aware you are it gives me an insight without meeting you in terms of who's around you what type of trainers you have around you uh how how much ego is playing a part into you know if, if you if you're going to tell me like you're going to be the best player in the nba i mean that's tricky right like chet holmgren kind of had that and mentality and he's turned out great so it's not exact science but too often i find that players who are overconfident coming in usually have a very rude wake-up call and once they have that rude wake-up call now you're in known unknown territory of how are they going to respond to being benched how are they going to respond to not getting pt I think with Grady Dick was a great example where you had to do probably a lot of interviews and psychological testing because this is a guy who was a Gatorade, you know, um, you know, Gatorade player of the year. He's been a starter on every single team he's played on in the last, you know, 15, you know, 10 years. And he's been great throughout, right? He's a highly touted prospect. He's a five-star guy. He's a very hypey, you know, lottery pick who a lot of people had projected as high as seven or eight. And now he's going to come to a team and he's going to go to the G League. How does he deal with it? And he dealt with it like a frigging champ. The Raptors should have and probably did know that about him when they drafted him, which is probably why they drafted him. That matters. Um, can the Raptors find a star? And do they even need to? A brief foray into draft sleepers and weak drafts. Look, every single year we have hype about this is a really great draft. This is not a great draft, etc. Look. I think a lot of people would make an argument that Anthony Edwards so far in his career has been better than any player from the 2021 draft. The 2020 draft was considered weak. The 2021 draft was considered very strong. The 2022 draft featuring Paolo and Chet was also considered kind of weak, right? Do you think that most general managers would consider Chet Holmgren a really weak pick? Like the number one, number two, and number three players in that draft are friggin' awesome. And I think Keegan Murray has been really awesome too. So that's the top four players. I think Jaden Ivey is kind of underrated. So that's five. And then you got Jalen Duran all the way at 13. He's pretty, pretty, pretty underrated too. So these were not super highly touted prospects. I got to tell you, Paolo was ranked as low as fifth, sixth on certain mock drafts uh, just weeks before the draft. And then he started to rise up, rise up, rise up. I mean, going into the day before the draft, Paolo was third. I had him third. Most people had him third. And then suddenly he was first. So it was very strange to see that. And look, we all have this weird revisionist history where, you know, we like to pretend that this draft was really weak because, you know, everyone knew the Anthony Bennett draft was going to be weak, right? But Giannis was in that draft, right? Like you do find strength at different places. Certain drafts just, they feature a lot of, variable players i think a hallmark of a draft full of sleepers would be a draft like the 2024 draft which features a ton of foreign players almost every player that's anything in this draft in the top 10 is foreign either from france or serbia or lithuania or whatever and i just feel like with these with these prospects it becomes a little bit harder because all the biases that i talked about from origin to role to program to looks to name all these things you know that might sway us one way or another about a prospect these things are mostly on display when it comes to foreign players and they're usually really hard to tell sometimes it works for foreign players you know sometimes like especially if a foreign player the previous year had a really big year like a and i mean like look at i mean victor Wembanyama, 
right? Victor Wembanyama has been great. Bilal Koulibaly has certainly not been bad in uh, in Washington. And so maybe there's a lot of buzz about like we got to find the next Victor Wembanyama, and, and maybe a little bit of that is swaying, you know, some of the Alex Sar uh, hype, right? For first overall pick, he's unquestionably the first overall pick. Don't be so quick to don't don't be so quick to say that. But also, don't be so quick to say Reed Shepard can't be the best player in this draft. He might be. We don't know that yet. I mean, it's not a bet I would take, but certainly AOC took a lot of flack for putting him first overall, and I can understand why. Sometimes we overhype international prospects. I think Dragon Bender is a really great example of that. This, uh, you know, Jan Vesely. There's a lot of players, you know, who were super overhyped coming from overseas. Andrea Bargnani, of course, familiar to Raptor fans. Um, but then, you know, there's these complete fringe unknowns like the Bruno Caboclos of the world where they're just like there's such a limited sample size and you're really swinging on athletic potential. But I'll tell you a player who was like Bruno Caboclo that did work out, Serge Ibaka. And I remember watching Serge Ibaka tape way back when, and I was just enamored with this guy as a prospect. I watched his tape and I'm like, the way this guy moves around the basketball court, the way he gets up, the way he spikes the ball, and even his shooting form, I was like, this guy's going to be really freaking good. And um, yeah, he slipped a lot. So expect a lot of that in this draft. And look, the Raptors have been scouting this draft all year. All year they've known that they're going to be pretty bad. And especially the last three months, they've really known that they're going to be heavily in this draft. And even the previous year, they had to have scouted this draft extensively to know to trade out of it. So this kind of begs the question, what changed, right? What changed with the Raptors? Is there, you know, a, a prospect that they're looking at in that top six, top seven range where they're like, just keep this under wraps, keep this a secret, but this guy is going to be really good. You know, who saw Shea being this good? The Raptors did. You know, the Raptors did, and the Clippers did, allegedly, because they drafted him. But the Raptors really saw Shea for what he was. He's a Canadian kid, so, you know, his local, whatever. But, you know, they saw him for what he was going to be. They saw Giannis for what he was going to be. They've seen these guys. I'm sure, you know, they saw Wemby for what he was going to be from miles away, and then they chose not to tank. What changed? Well, I think it's safe to say it's probably someone international. It's probably Zachary Wiesache or Nikola Topic or one of those. I think it's, or it could be Alex Sar. The cool thing about the Raptors roster right now is you don't need to find an A1 superstar. You don't need to find a typical first overall pick because in my humble opinion, you already have that guy in Scotty Barnes. He's not a perfect basketball player, but he's definitely who you're building around for the future. So the fact that this draft doesn't feature necessarily um, you know, a level of prospect like a Anthony Edwards or a Victor Wembanyama or something like that. Well, let's be honest. The Anthony Edwards draft didn't feature Anthony Edwards until Anthony Edwards became Anthony Edwards. And so when I'm looking at this draft and I'm really, really studying it, are there some guys who have A1 star potential? What do I mean by that? I don't mean MVPs. I don't think there's an MVP in this draft. I would be very confident to say there's not going to be an MVP in this draft, partially because I think Luca and Wemby and possibly Scotty and like Anthony Edwards, I think these guys are gonna these guys are probably gonna have this word on lock. I mean, you could you could throw Jokic in there, Shea, like there's a lot of talent. I don't think anyone in this draft is that talented. And I know some people are probably going to say I'm crazy for putting Scotty in that conversation, but he's my dude and I got to put him in that conversation. But I think he'll get there. So MVP is probably not it. But could there be a Jalen Brunson level guy? Could there be a Julius Randle level guy? Could there be an OG Ananobi, a Pascal Siakam? Are these not like all-stars? All-star level impact guys? I think they are, you know? And I think this draft probably has more of those guys than we currently realize and the raptors will have three cracks to get one maybe they'll have three cracks to get three that would be great but i think they'll have three cracks to get one and i'm very curious to see if the draft odds will be on their side i would love if the raptors draft top four because i do think that you know there might be a player here that i'm really getting very high on and i'll talk about that in my draft analysis video in a couple of days or maybe in a week from now but 
I wanted to lay out my thoughts in this video, partially because I really don't think that people understand how this works, you know, the scouting part of this. I feel like a lot of people get super hyped. They're not really looking at their biases. They're not really looking at skill sets. They're not really looking at how players project forward. They're not, they're just interested in the hype. You know, this guy is the next Luca, and so he's great. Let me address the player's choice thing. Honestly, I got really, really pissed. And the more I thought about it during the during the rest of the day, I got pissed. I'm not gonna talk shit about people who are not here right now, but man, that dude, Mars, like, yo, we need to get on another show, bro, because you your energy was just like, fuck that shit. This talk about, you know, Cade has been nauseating for the last three years. Let me point out to a stat about Cade Cunningham that I think is worth thinking about really deeply. Okay. Cade Cunningham through 144 games has 1.2 win shares. Now you say, well, he plays on a pretty bad team. He has bad teammates. He has this, he has that, blah, 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 blah. I got you. I got you. Do you know that Tyreek Evans, who played on a pretty bad Sacramento team, and LeBron James, who played on a pretty bad Cleveland team as rookies, had more win shares in their first 30 games than Cade has had in his first 144? You know, Scotty Barnes doesn't exactly play for a great team this year. He has more win shares. He had more win shares. Scotty Barnes had more win shares through 25 games this year than Cade has had through his 144 games in his career. Let that sink into your head. So it makes me upset. It makes me upset when people are going to call me an idiot or, you know, call me out for, for having a different take on Cade because they don't see him clearly. That was one thing. The second thing is I made the disastrous, disastrous, you know, take of Malik Monk is one of the top three most talented half court playmakers. I do want to say something though. He is damn good. And I think I just went a little too far by the numbers. He is number one in the NBA in assists on drives not assists per hundred assists period he plays 26 minutes a game and he gets more assists on drives than luca and shea now why is that it's physics it's that simple it's physics malik is a downhill finisher who has a pull-up threat who happens to be a super underrated passer who plays with some excellent finishers and some really great spacing in sacramento it's a combination of things now there is a gap between saying someone is and someone is talented enough to be better than whatever. Like, like right now, you know, what if, I don't know if he is, but I think Grayson Allen's like leading the league in three point shooting. So you could say he's the best three point shooter in the NBA. But then if someone says, you really think Grayson Allen's a better three point shooter than Steph Curry, you might pause a little bit, be like, uh, let me walk that back a little bit. So I said that Malik was one of the top three, you know, um, half court playmakers in the nba and then i walked it back to saying guard and then i said let me let me amend it to top eight i feel like we really like trash people for not standing on business right here's the thing i don't think that it's a bad thing to change your mind when someone presents you with a better argument i think it's a good thing it's a great thing actually it shows maturity you know two days ago we were we were debating bradley beal versus um Bradley Beal versus Desmond Bain. And I made a case for why Desmond Bain was better on the show. And there was a gentleman that I was talking to who I've come to admire a lot on that show. I'm forgetting his name right now, but he's the older gentleman on the show. He's great. And we were just talking and, you know, he was just like, you know, and I was giving him the numbers on Desmond Bain. I was giving him like all the stats and all the numbers. And we were just talking. He's like, you might've sold me on this. You might've sold. And I never thought anything less of him for that. I never thought, oh, stand on business. Be, be, you know, be about what you're about. This is, this is dumbass talk. Real people change their mind. Yeah, so if someone gives you a better idea, you should change your mind. And frankly, I feel like it's time for a lot of people to really start to second guess, uh, you know, just reevaluate your thoughts on Cade. Now, also, in fairness, I did not realize that his, his mid-range jumper has been so much better the last two months because I was going on old data because I was planning pen dance through most of February. And I'm not making excuses. I should know. I'm going on the show. You know, uh, you have 1,500 people watching. It's like 15,000 views or whatever. Yeah, like, you know, you should know everything when you're going on these shows talking about guards in the NBA. But truth be told, the information that I was working off of on Kate's mid-range jumper when I said he was struggling with the midi pull-up was dated so i made the disastrous thing of saying kate struggles with mid-range shots i do however want to say when we talk about middies analytics how analytics are ble uh, bleeding out middies think about the numbers that we're talking about okay in the nba today the average average shooter average three-point shooter is like 36 percent plus okay and that number is trending up 
don't be surprised in a couple of years if the average three-point shooter in the NBA is 37.5%. Do you know how efficient you have to be on a mid-range shot to compete with a 37% three-point shot? It's it's insanity. Cade Cunningham shoots 48 to 49% on, on, on his midi pull-ups or mid-range shots, not many pull-ups, mid-range shots. I don't know if that's self-generated or whatever, but I was just looking at a shot chart. That's less efficient than a 33% three-point shooter. And I'm I'm sorry, but 33% three-point shooters are considered bad three-point shooters in today's NBA. So it's just not a super effective shot. Guys who are consistently mid-range assassins are shooting high 50s in those mid-range shots, and those are still not super efficient shots. They're just open and they're available, and so you take them. I think the discussion about analytics and how, how many people have such strong opinions about analytics, I'll leave this lab with one thing. And I think it's a really good metaphor for everything. Imagine you go to a gym, right? And let's just say the weights are all weird. Like there's no consistency to the weights at all. They're just slabs of brick, right? And slabs of clay. And, and you know, they're just like different weights and you got to lift them to figure out like how much one weighs. And so something might be really small, but it weighs like 50 pounds and something might be really large and it weighs like 20 pounds. You know what I mean? And so can you really look at two weights and say that one's heavier than that one? Or do you actually have to pick them up? You do have to pick them up, right? And it's the same thing with an argument or a debate, in my opinion. If you're going to debate somebody, if you're going to have a really strong take about Malik Monk or Scotty Barnes or any fucking you know, player in the league or any stat or any you know thing, you better understand what the other person's talking about before you start having strong opinions about it straight up like you're gonna have a strong opinion about why warp doesn't matter you better understand intellectually how warp is calculated don't broad brush all analytics because you're afraid of math right so i feel like i'm having a conversation with somebody who's not here right now so that might not be very entertaining for you guys but man that 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 chat really pissed me off today and i'm reading all the comments so definitely go over to player's choice and give them a piece of your mind on, you know, if, if you agree with my take that Kate Cunningham is not a three-star player because they had Kate Cunningham over Fred Van Vliet. Here's something humorous for this community. I am now over there considered the Fred Van Vliet booster. I keep telling them that I'm not a fan of Fred Van Vliet and that I pretty much devoted a channel to running him out of town, but they're telling me that I'm boosting Fred Van Vliet because I think Fred Van Vliet's a better player than a lot of players that they had above them. And it's just, you know, here's the thing. I resented Fred Van Vliet for saying he was a top 50 player in the NBA. And that list is way shorter in his mind, a quote that is literally like burned in my brain. But I'm not going to fucking disrespect the guy and call him a scrub. My criteria for a three star was that you could be a key starter on a championship team. Fred Van Vliet can absolutely be a key starter on a championship team. If he's on your team, it's not, you can't win a championship with him. He can't be one of your top three guys. That is firm. My issue with Fred was he thought he was a four star going on five star. And I'm like, chill, you're not Kyrie Irving, you're not Shea, you're not, you're not even Desmond Bain, but he's just outside that conversation of Desmond Bain. Like he is not a scrub. And I resent this. And, and you know, again, like it, it drove me crazy earlier in the year when people were saying him and De Dennis Schroeder are basically equivalent. Get the hell out of here. Dennis Schroeder might not be in the NBA in two years. Fred Van Vliet making 40 million, 30 million, 20 million for the rest of his life. So I just feel like, look, we I refuse to be a caricature. I refuse to be a character in some soap opera that someone is having for me. I'm not going to be the guy who hates Fred Van Vliet if you are doing something and saying something about Fred Van Vliet that is factually incorrect and disrespecting the guy. If you want to say, you know, if, if I'm having a debate with, with my friend and he's like, I could probably beat Fred Van Vliet one-on-one, -on -one, I would just tell him Fred would beat you 101 to nothing. He would beat me 101 to nothing. What are you, crazy? I just believe personally that you should be honest, that you should be honest about things and that you should not exaggerate things in order to make a point. And I feel like, yeah, that's that's where I'll leave that. Let's get to the comments real quick. Uh, Country Kong saying, Rob, you're low-key Fred's biggest fan. That's hilarious. Um, uh, Country Kong saying, Rob, can I get my flowers for Keontae? No, you cannot. Uh, hello, Rob from Japan. 20... Uh, Hey, what's going on, man? Uh, hey, Rob, checking in from Egypt. How do you feel about Ron Holland of the G League Ignite? He fits the team in terms of positional need. I'm enamored by his offensive upside. Um, I haven't watched this tape yet. I've watched one game. I cannot have a honest conversation about him until I dig more into it. But from the one game I watched, very intriguing. 
Um, I'm a little bit higher on his teammate, but we'll see. Uh, sounds like multiple players. Rob is a dictionary. Where does he find the time? But I'm grateful I can be filled in. Sorry, I'm missing where that. Um, talent and fit definitely matter. Look at how Pascal and Scotty fit together. Should we address Cam Whitmore? Hell no. Yo, bro, get off your fucking Grady, Grady hate, bro. Like, he's been great. Definitely need to draft someone who plays defense. I like Reed Shepard. Draft's kind of weak, though. I think we addressed this. I feel like the rest prospects in this draft are no better than Joe Smith. But Joe Smith went first overall, so, you know. Uh, or you trade the pick for something that fits. Yeah, but in a in a draft in which, you know, the reputation is already that it's not a super strong draft, maybe the offers are not as great. But I agree. If you get a top three pick and someone's really enamored with one of those players, you might get a pretty, you know, an offer you can't refuse. Um, Brax, he was saying, what do you think about Alexander Starr or Stephen, uh, Stephon Castle? Uh, both are definitely defensive minded guys. Both seem like guys who have a high floor and good enough ceiling. Uh, with Alex Starr, I've only watched... 25 minutes uh i can say his his timing and his hand eye coordination are pretty elite um i like some of his transition stuff and the raptors seem to be like really pushing for a transition like with rj emmanuel scotty i think alex star presents a very interesting and his jump shot is while not great shows potential so very interesting uh stefan uh, stefan castle i haven't watched enough uh Miles Bridges seems like a good fit minus his off-court issues. That's an understatement. Grayson Allen over Gary Trent. Uh, yeah. Mm. I don't like Grayson Allen, but I got to say, yeah. Morning, ladies. Disrespectful for no reason. I need Raptors. I think Raptors won't have a chance at Sar, uh, uh, Resache, Topic or Shepard. The Raptors may have a chance at dealing him because Blazers likely not draft a guard. I'm not really enamored with Rob Dillingham, to be honest. Um, so yeah. No, I do not. Don't know. Um is Reed Shepard that good to be the top picks? <sighs> That's going to be really, really hard to sell to a fan base, right? Really hard. Because he is a little smaller. You know, he is not a super athlete, but more like, isn't he a really good athlete? If you think about like the things that actually matter in terms of coordination, balance, and I think his workouts will be very important in terms of determining his space in the top three, but I'm firmly... A believer that if someone takes him top three top four i'll understand it and that guy just wins like he has a really really good like kentucky is a super young team they're usually not really in the in the conversation for you know in, in my opinion not really in the competition uh, conversation for national championships each year because of how much turnover they have and typically typically you know teams that win the national championship and you know in march madness are usually older teams with a lot of upperclassmen and so you know kentucky is like an nba farm factory but i think reed shepherd would be like one of the biggest reasons why i think they actually have a chance he's really good um last year i looked at filipowski last year but not this year so more tape needs to be thing Masai is going to take one of the wings at five or six when they're available of williams or holland Williams is interesting. Yeah, I, I, I do. I do have. Um, I think I stick by my thing about I think it's going to be a foreign guy. Uh, I'm looking at Nikola Topic. I'm looking at uh, Matas Bazelis. And I'm looking at Zachary Risache. Risache, because of the shooting upside and two way potential transition play, uh, Bazelis, because of just overall shot making size skill ratio and i think like they just generally like players like this and topic because i think he fills a really big need for a lead initiator off the bench who gets into the paint at will plus the connection with darko being from the same country speaking the same language if there is a coach that can get the most out of him it's probably one who speaks his language and i really think that he and scotty would have just an incredible incredible um chemistry um and again, 
I think he also works really well off of guys like RJ. Now, I see a little bit of Manu Ginobili, and as someone pointed out something hilarious, which is that Darko Ryakovich already compared RJ Barrett to, uh, to Manu Ginobili, which I think is a little funny because I, earlier in the year, when we were talking about Scotty being more of a secondary creator than a primary creator, also compared Scotty Barnes a little bit to, a man, uh, to, to Manu Ginobili. So a team full of Manu Ginobili's, what could be better to watch? You know, if you if you're a fan of Manu Ginobili, you understand what I mean. Um, James saying Cody Williams should be the pick. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, he could be. Uh, it depends on how high the Raptors get. Um, Derek Edwards saying, I feel like the Raptors are building a family team that that's presentable, like all the MLS teams. I don't know what that means, family feeling team. But yeah, in my last live, I went into a pretty extended deep dive into why we root for losers. And I think like the Raptors have overindulged into the underdog mindset of undrafted guys, undersized guys, feel good stories. I'm personally, I'm tired of the whole Rudy narrative. You know, like we don't need to always have like this underdog you know mentality and i think like you know if you look at teams that have won championships in the last 25 years it's not a lot of teams the raptors are one of them so i think it's time to let go of the underdog mentality one of the big five biggest cities in the league you know one of the most expensive cities in north america one of the most beautiful cities in north america in my opinion um what is the need for all this inferiority complex and shit right so it doesn't need to be anything of that sort we don't always have to root for losers family friendly team well Derek what does a family friendly team mean like what kind of player doesn't fit into a family friendly you know thing like who is not family friendly I'm trying to understand what family friendly is like is that is that a code for you know a certain type of player a certain type of background certain type of look certain type of play style like what are we talking about here um Uh, Kentucky lost last night to the 14th seed. Reed Shepard had three points and choked down the stretch with bad turnovers. Holy shit. I did not know this. Need to watch. Need to watch. Well, that might be a great thing for the Raptors if he ends up falling to seven or, you know, six because of that. That would be interesting. Well, he won't fall to seven. If he falls to seven, he'll go to the Spurs. But if he ends up falling to six because of that, again, I don't think, I don't think too much of, you know, March Madness being the, you know, the Holy Grail of anything. And I think like, when I think about biases, that's one thing that I am really, really uh, firm on in terms of March Madness can over inflate someone's value because people assume it's the big game, right? The Charlotte Criminals is not a family friendly team, for instance. Ooh. I get what you're saying. There has been a lot of really, really terrible stuff that's happened in Charlotte. Kai Jones, you know, um, the Brandon Miller situation, the Miles Bridges situation feels like the most extreme, but I believe there was also an issue, an, an issue with Montrezl Harrell there as well. So I get what you're saying. So you mean like, a, like so not the Portland Trailblazers of 1999 to 2002. I got you. No Bonzi Wells, no, no Rasheed Wallace. Personally, I, I could use a little bit of that. I, I would love a little bit of edge, a little bit of fight, and a little bit of character. And I feel like this team could use it so that Scotty can stop catching strays from the media. Um, I like tough guys. I like, you know, some of my favorite players of all time have had that, you know, rough around the edges image. Allen Iverson, Ron Artest, Rasheed Wallace. These were the guys who were posters on my wall growing up. So I don't know. I, I like I like players like that personally. And I would love to see more of those players on the Raptors. Fuck the family friendly stuff. I don't care. Um, would you be interested in Andrew Wiggins if the Warriors move in the offseason? He can be our three and D with some shot creation. Um <clears throat> I could think about it. I could entertain the idea of uh of Andrew Wiggins because I'm not as down on him as everybody else, but I understand that there there better be some really concrete understanding of what personal issues he's been going through. Number one, whatever that is, you need to figure it out and you need to figure out something you want to deal with. Number one. Number two, what are you getting back with him and for what? If it's Bruce Brown and you're getting a future pick back in order to take the contract and you're getting Moses Moody, now I can certainly see the I can see the rationale for it. 
But if you're getting like a Ochai Abaji level prospect with him to take on that contract, I'm not I'm not sure I'm willing to do that. So yeah. Dan Dan, the interior the complex needs to go ASAP. I agree. Um, anyways, guys, take care. Have a great day. Enjoy your day. Um, yeah, talk to y'all later. And yeah, if you feel like doing me a little bit of a favor, go over to Player's Choice and I don't know. Go 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 like go like some of the comments and go downvote some of those negative comments. I know it's kind of weird, but I feel like I got really ganged up on there, and I don't fucking appreciate it. And I hope that I have a chance very soon with Mars on a show to really give that dude a piece of my mind. Because honestly, like, I don't get pissed off that often lately, but that live that we did earlier today on Player's Choice, I gotta tell you, like, it, it really it really got under my skin a little bit. Some of the some of the shit that was happening there. Peace, guys. Have a good one.